Well, welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad that you have come along. This is going to be a great show. It might be my first four-time guest. I don't know. We'll see. And I'm, I love having him on every time I have him on. Uh, I have somebody reach out to me who this message has been exactly what they needed to hear. So that's why I keep on inviting him. I'm so glad he keeps coming back. But I'm going to introduce him to you in just a second. I want to make sure you know that this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. If you are a faithful church and you're looking for a pastor, we encourage you to come and post your jobs with us. We would love to try to think about how you we could serve you. We have almost 600 students. And that is a 400% increase over the last five years here at Wesley Biblical Seminary. So we are rolling and we have a beautiful opportunity to serve churches, particularly there's many churches in the evangelical Wesleyan tradition. And at this moment where the Global Methodist Church is emerging, it's been a beautiful opportunity for us to serve the Global Methodist Church, but we're not limited in denominations. We would love to serve anybody who is wanting to be trained at a school that's faithful to the the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So check us out at wbs.edu. Secondly, WPO Development. They're a great group that comes alongside churches, schools, academic institutions, and helps them plan and actualize capital campaigns. And they've done that successfully for around 250 organizations around the country. And if you're look, if you're kind of like not sure organization, like how you're going to take steps forward, I highly recommend you check out WPO Development. And their team, Keith Waters is the CEO there. And he says, if you don't have a plan, any path will get you there. And that's certainly true. So there's that. Also, several things from andymillerthird.com that are available. That's andymillerii.com. I have five steps to deeper teaching and preaching, a 45-minute teaching and a tool that you can use to help you study scripture in a more in-depth way with the aim of serving your congregations or your classes better. In addition to classes, there are two courses available on my website, one on the afterlife and one on Jude. I'd love for you to check that out. In addition, I have a few books. I have a recent book that's come out on Jude called Contender. So you can find out all about that stuff at andymillerthird.com. Okay, I'm going to welcome in to the show my friend, clinical psychologist, author, and TikTok star, Dr. David <laughs> E. Clark. David, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Now, I'm the TikTok guy, so we only have like 30 seconds to talk. I, That's I'm right. <laughs> Boy, it is amazing. Like, I, you are exploding online with this ability to connect to who would have thought? It just took a took about a couple of decades of your practice before the time came for TikTok to come along where you could just take off. I know. God knows what he's doing. We never anticipated this. I was never going to do this. <laughs> but God knows what he's doing. He's changed my practice and, and our ministry, Sandy and I's ministry completely. And we're reaching so many people, especially ladies in these abusive relationships. It, and he's using technology to do it. It's just what Jesus would do. Of course. Absolutely. You have your bracelet. on. What would Jesus do? He uh, Now, tell me. It, 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 just a little bit about your your career. What's happening with this? I mean, you were telling me before we we came on here before we started recording that you've almost stopped your in person practice. It's gone primarily online. Is that right? Yes, through the video, you know, the TikTok, the YouTube, the podcast, Instagram. I mean, you, Facebook has has kind of exploded too. We do these live streams, and so I phased out of the in person ongoing therapy, which I did for thirty five years. And God's moved us. I've got one guy that I'm seeing, <laughs> one lone in-person client. I have to actually put jeans on to see him, which bothers me. Anyway, <laughs> I wear my shorts. And now it's all phone. It's all phone coaching. And, wow. and giving giving people resources and encouragement, what the Bible says about abuse, and you can leave, and God wants you and your kids to be safe. It's just a whole new arena that's just incredible. And we're loving it. I love it. And you've had books published by major publishers, Moody, Folks in the Family. I think I could list several of them. But you even uh, made a pivot now to self-publishing. Why is that? Oh, man. There are a number of reasons. Uh, number one, the, the Christian publisher, it takes so long to get a book out. Yeah. If I sold one today with a proposal, it'd be a year, year and a half before the book would even come out. They put you through all kinds of you know editing processes, which I've, I've grown to hate because I've written that and I like that. Okay, <laughs> and if Sandy likes it, it's fine. And of course, they it, it, not that it's a money issue, but they they don't pay you much, and you get a little bit of promotion, two or three months. You know how that works, Andy. And then they're done with you. So you continue to promote their book and your book, and they make money, and you don't. 
<laughs> so we don't need that anymore. Praise God. These self-published books, we're selling them. We're, we're, we can make them affordable. We make money. The publishers are just out in the cold. Oh, interesting. So, so where do people go to get your books and, and these resources? Just the website. Everything's at the website, David E. Clark, PhD.com. Clark of the knee, David E. Clark, PhD.com. Everything is there. Yeah. And it's yeah. easy to access. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you right now because I just heard, I, I don't know what's happening. Um, and you might need to read some of your own books, but I've heard you call your wife the blonde for decades, but you've just called her Sandy two or three times. <laughs> is everything okay, Dr. Clark? Man, I know. It's it's funny. Of course, she went when, when with a friend. <laughs> at Sandy. <laughs> okay. Strangers. Oh, she's still the blonde. Oh my goodness. She's the wonderful blonde. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. I'm I'm getting I'm calling her her name more these days, I guess. <laughs> it, 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 that made you stand out to me. Is this like kind of like the fun thing that you talked about? And so people can go back and check out some of the things you've done in the past. Okay. Well, there is a new book that's come out, and I'm excited about it, not because I need it. Okay. I just want to make that clear. Of course not. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm, I know in, in, in my own ministry and serving congregations, this is an issue that people are working through on a regular basis. So here's the title, stop feeling guilty for your divorce, beat Satan, beat shame and live in God's grace and freedom. So there's something behind this, Dr. Clark, that you have in mind, as you're saying, like there's these feelings that people have in, and that's kind of your business. You deal with people feeling, but why, why is it? that we need to tackle this problem of people sensing and feeling guilt regarding divorce. Well, Andy, there are so many good-hearted Christian women, especially, and some men, but mostly women in my experience, they, they just plague themselves with guilt. They're good. They want to do it God's way. They're very sensitive to that. They did their best in their marriage. If they're married to a person that's horrible, Okay, even if they have a biblical reason, when they, they they don't, the last thing they want is a divorce. But when they make that decision, or somebody divorces them, they have a way of thinking: Was it me? I must have done something wrong. And so they continue to just plague themselves with guilt. So I had client after client just stuck in this horrible, really not even guilt. It goes into shame. That's what Satan wants: shame. And yeah. Satan wants that for a lifetime, never to go away. And that affects every one of your relationships. And God is, is saying in the Bible, I don't want that. So I thought, right. you know what? I need to write, I write a book on this. We made it just an ebook because more folks are buying ebooks these days. It's laid out. And I think there's a real need for it. And it's, it's God is blessed that it's helping people. Well, and I love it with your books. They're also kind of like uh, manuals, like emergency manuals, so to speak. Like you come in and you have these difficult situations, not the common thing people are writing about, but really, it, and it's a little longer than your more recent books as well. So what you have in it is like this step-by-step -step process that people can work through. And you mentioned already, and I love I love this, and this might not have happened if you would have published uh, with a, a, a bigger publisher, um, all throughout the book, you lower you have you have Satan's Satan mentioned, but he's in lowercase. <laughs> uh, you noticed that I knew you would. <laughs> oh yeah, and I had to correct that as we were typing it. I had to correct it every time. Okay, now, I'm not going to give Satan a capital S. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and that this is I think theologically this is one of the challenges that we have is that, that it seems to be this is what Satan is attacking. Why why is it that he wants to attack marriages, Doctor Clark? Oh, he hates marriage like nothing else. Marriage is a very picture, as you know, of Christ's relationship with the church. Oh, uh, it's God's plan for the family. And so he hates that. And so he 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 knows if he can if he can break a marriage up, cause a problem, or even if a marriage has to break up, and there's biblical reasons, and that happens, right. abuse, whatever, then he he's not done with you. He's never done with you. Now he can use the aftermath of divorce and how difficult it is and the traumas. He just inhabits those and continues to wreak havoc when it's all over. And God is saying, I want, I want you to get a reset. So Satan never stops trying. Of course, Satan wants to now infect and cause your ongoing shame and guilt to ruin your next marriage, if you don't mind. And that's exactly what can happen if you don't clean it out of your system. Yeah. So you, and you have four steps for destroying shame through this book. Like you're working through. So so why don't you walk through those with us? Like, what is it that we need to do? And, and, and some of these could be applied in other ways to other ways that we experience shame, but particularly as it relates to divorce. Here's, here's the outline. 
It's, it's first of all, we start as we always should start with what the Bible says. Yeah. I've got more scripture, as you know, Andy, because you've read it in this book than in any book I've ever written, maybe in all my books combined. <laughs> I felt wow. that way as I was doing it because I thought I'm going to really, these are Christian people, that's my audience, and I'm going to let them know, let God's word speak. Who cares what Dave Clark says? I have a way of presenting it like we all do, but uh, and you too, Andy, but I, I want God to speak very clearly. So what does the Bible say about marriage, about divorce, about remarriage? Because people wonder about that and about his his grace and forgiveness and, and the reset. Yes. So all that I go into great detail on with a lot of scripture um, because I could just give my opinion, but who cares? I mean, God has made it very clear. Of course, every story in the Bible is that of, of, of sin and restoration and forgiveness and new life. Yes. So I hit that hard. And then once we clear that, you're not done yet, even though that's a big step forward. Now, what does psychology say? God's yeah. truth in psychology. There's healing we have to do. There are traumas we've been through. And even in the situation where you, you have been married and you got divorced for a biblical reason, there's still traumas you have to work through because if you don't, all that will create and sustain shame. So let's heal psychologically. Once we have the biblical foundation, God wants that. And then thirdly, what, what is the third one? Oh, yes. Oh, how can I forget? What Satan. does Satan say? Yeah. <laughs> Small s. He, yes. I've, I've, after talking to people for decades, I've got 105 of his classic, his most popular divorce lies. Divorce yes. and lies. Right. And I'll give the lie and then what, how you can respond to that lie very specifically. And that's going to be powerful. And then lastly, I've got this whole community now that God has created for us of, of people that are following us and involved in social media, people that I've talked to on the, on the phone. And their input has been so important in all of my books. And now this one especially. Well, and my question was, how do you, how do you, how, what things did you do? What did, how did God guide you in terms of what helped you get out of the guilt and get out of the shame? And they gave me some wonderful ideas. So those are things that actually worked for actual people. So I think it's a, it's a great package. I love it. Well, I want to kind of just hit on all four of those areas just a little bit. Of course, I don't want to give it the full treatment because what they need to do is get your book or check out your TikTok channels and those sort of things um, or TikTok channel. But the, the, the biblical case is that the first thing, and, and you always do that. And just to, we don't, don't need to talk about it here necessarily, but I always love it. It's coming somewhere in a David Clark book, chapter eight comes in and you just present the gospel after you've kind of talked about what the Bible says, you're like everywhere in a David Clark book, it's somewhere it comes along and then says, Hey, are you a Christian? If not, here's how you become one. So I and love that. Always, always. That, that of course, is so important. Oh, man yeah. alive. And, of course, it's so simple. And, of course, I make the point, like in all my books, if, you, if you're going to pull off what I'm talking about in this book, it's extremely hard. You can't do that unless you know God through Jesus. So, yeah, that's my dad and I were very big on that. Of course, my dad's gone now. He's always in heaven. And, and now but we're going to continue giving the gospel. Yes, we are. Love it. So what are some of the, the, the biblical reasons for divorce? And like you, you walk through that and you, you want to be honest with people with what's going on. And I love that you just, you, you print, present this pretty clearly at the beginning, but give us some of those reasons. There are three in my way of thinking after, after careful study, we, and two are accepted by the Christian community almost universally. And the third is not, I'm in the minority okay. on that, but too bad. I'm right. I think okay. God. Has, 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 has taught that. But the first one is adultery. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 19, Jesus himself makes this clear. This is a reason. Um, and all these reasons, like adultery, once that happens, the marriage is shattered. It is destroyed. You could heal from that uh, if, if you choose, but that, that, that breaks a marriage. So adultery. And, and with all the cases I've seen, frankly, it's not just one instance. It's a pattern. And the person's not right. going to stop it. Okay, so adultery. And then we have 1 Corinthians 7.15, which I think covers the other two, and there are other verses we could look at, but we have the abandonment by the unbelieving spouse. Right. This is clear. Paul, of course, ta taught that. And most Christians would say, and pastors, yes, that's certainly one. Um, the third one, and this has probably been oh, maybe four or five years now I've come to this after a lot of study. Uh, Dr. Wayne Gruden was instrumental in my understanding this brilliant man. And he was really, the, I think, the pioneer here. And that is 1 Corinthians seven fifteen, the last part, when he says, in such circumstances, what that is referring to is, I think, chronic ongoing abuse, whether physical or emotional, would also be a biblical reason for divorce. 
Yeah. So going back to the, the first one, you talk about adultery. This is where it gets a uh, little people can can try to, I don't know, uh, then what do you do with the needle? You take the thread, the needle, you try to thread the needle. So there's a, well, what is it is, is adultery addiction to pornography is adultery uh, an emotional affair where you're, you know, li living in an intimate sharing secrets and being you know intimate in ways that's not physical to the spouse or is it just when the act is committed help us understand like what what what's in, what's involved with that what is adultery jesus himself uses the term pornea in that passage and that is a broader term for sexual sin so i believe and i've seen it in person in my office over 35 years 40 years certainly this would be physical adultery actually yeah. sleeping with having physical contact with someone not your spouse but it also includes, in my mind, pornography. That is adultery. It's it's a it's a problem with the mind. Jesus himself says in Matthew 5, if you even look upon a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. Okay, that that's that's a good definition. I will include script clubs, I will include uh, massage parlors and all these emotional affairs. Many men have tried to tell me in my office, well, Dave, but I I never touched her. She was in Texas, it was just all online. I said, I, I don't make any difference. That you mm. have committed adultery, the intimacy, the sexual things that were shared, the bonding, putting that person over your wife. And look, every single emotional affair involves the sexual, mm. the, the only in your mind. Well, of course it does. This isn't a friend. Wow. So no, all right, those right. things count. Uh, and if someone doesn't agree with that in my office, I, I, I say, well, there's, you see that there? That's called a door. Leave. <laughs> I I, I'm not interested in talking to you. I mean, hey. That's right. <laughs> I love that. You say that very often. I mean, I think it's helpful. It's like, well, th this is, I'm not changing on this, by the way. Like uh, this, this is the foundation that I'm moving from. I love it. That Now, one thing in interesting, like the challenge can be sometimes is people, e e let's say an emotional affair or something's happening, but what, even if it's just attention that you take away from yourself, like some, some people talk about the Mike Pence or the Billy Graham rule, those type of things that are around where you're not alone with another person. Like, I even wonder when we when we move to the place for and putting ourselves in, or people put themselves in positions where they just have a deep friendship with somebody who's not their spouse, but of the opposite sex. I mean, some people say, well, Andy, how can you work? How can you live in the world if you do that? But do you think those type of boundaries are appropriate? Absolutely. Because I've seen the carnage and so have you being in ministry, Andy, of what happens when you don't do that. And mm -hmm. sin is like you're on a path. It doesn't seem so bad at first. Well, I took my secretary to lunch. It was it was a uh, secretary's day. It was just the two of us and her and I, you know, my 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 uh, my work wife, you know, that's kind of a joke. It's there's nothing oh, funny yeah. about it. That's all reserved. Wow. God wants all that for your spouse. So there have to be clear lines. You can get along with people. I've told couples for years, hey, if you are, if you know, you're a couple, you have you do not have individual, you know, opposite sex friends that are just yours. That's wrong. You're if you're single, go ahead. You're married. You have couple friends. Yeah. And, and you do couple things together. Because once you step outside of that, Satan is thrilled. And and two years from now, three years from now, six months from now, you're gonna cross the line. Wow. And at that point, it seems like no big deal because you've already gone this far. Why play with fire? Oh, no, I'm mm. very, very clear on that because we see all the horrible things that happen if you don't do that. Mm. Mm -hmm. So like even even people who use that language work wife, that's that that's like a, a red flag. Like, let's not even let's not even say these type of things. I love no. it. I mean, I love that no. you're emphasizing. I want people need to hear this, Dr. Clark, that it's, it's easy because, it, well, you know, our job requires us to have to be alone and we, we just need to do this. And so uh, what, what else can I do? Well, yeah, there's know. all kinds of things you can do. And what's happening is, because I talk to these people <laughs> all the time, they're, if they're honest, there's something else happening. It is not mm -hmm. just business. Uh, you know, I, I you find this person attractive. They're, they're a friend. There's a little bit of a vibe going on. That's what Satan can play with. There shouldn't mm -hmm. be a vibe. In mm -hmm. fact, I was, I was taught this years ago. At the beginning of my practice, it was very wise from both my dad and a great psychologist named Dr. Tim Foster. He said, look, if, you're, if you ever see a lady, and you, you don't see them before you come in, obviously, you, you don't know what they look like. If a woman comes in, and, and you for whatever reason, she's she's seductive, or she's coming on to you, or even if that's not happening, but you find yourself thinking, wow, this is a beautiful woman. That is the last mm -hmm. time you're going to see her. You come up with any excuse at all, <laughs> but you do not see her again. 
Wow. Boom. End of story. I, that only happened to me. I'm thinking back on my career and the blonde can't hear me, which is good. But uh, she already knows. I think it happened maybe twice. Over yeah. how many thousands of people have I seen? I thought, yeah. you know what? Yeah, there's just, I don't even know the person, but there's just a little bit of a vibe. We're attracted to certain people. There's like a chemistry. Okay, done. Yeah. I don't think I'm the right psychologist for you. Why would that be? Well, you come up with whatever reason, you know? Yeah. And you just move. And the expertise, there's a vibe here. It's not, you know, I don't think I can be the right person for you. Boom. See, that's, and so you have a secretary. How many times, hundreds of times, I've had men in my office, they've ruined their marriage because they went too far with their secretary or some other coworker. Right. At the right. beginning, they would have said, oh, what's the big deal? There's nothing going on here. Yeah, well, there is now. And your wife's yes. sobbing on my couch and, and you've destroyed trust because of some woman that you went too far with. So mm, don't even, of course, this is the message of scripture. Don't even go up even near the line. Right. Not a hint. You don't want to see the line. Get away right. from it. I love it. I love it. Running from that. I so appreciate it. I think it's just helpful to see how people get in these situations. I don't, I know that we're kind of emphasizing on, on this book, thinking about divorce and where it's headed um, and what and how we move beyond that. But you, I, people can look back to and some other things you've written about abuse and why we need to run from it. And part of this is uh, generally like you are hard on them. These dirt bag narcissists, you just Damn. like you, how do we see a narcissist coming, Dr. Clark? What do we what do we need to, like what do we do? Oh no, 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 I'm asking that. What what is a narcissist? Like why do we need to avoid them and who are they? These are supremely selfish individuals. It is all about them. They are the center of the universe. That's the core value and principle of a narcissist. He really is his own. Most of them are men, there's some women, but he is his own god. Hmm. That would be bad enough. You can see all the terrible things that would happen there. But it's the person who is highly critical of you and uh, verbally abusive. And there, there may be some physical uh, abuse. There's no communication. Your needs mean nothing to him. Mm -hmm. What it, The bottom line is, it is just blaming you for everything, controlling. There's all kinds of things we could say. But the bottom line is, he is destroying you day by day, mm -hmm. slowly destroying another person, of course, the wife. Mm. Everybody outside the marriage thinks this guy's the greatest because they don't mm. live with him. The covert narc is, is loved by the community and at church. He knows the pastor. You know what? You're not living with him. These ladies are dying. He has no use for you. So mm -hmm. it's just a steady diet of destruction and tearing someone down. And they know exactly what they're doing and they enjoy doing it. It's entertaining because they have no conscience. There is no empathy. So I'm mm. describing in my books, this is a monster. This isn't just a selfish guy, your typical man that needs some correction. I did that for 30 years. That's not a problem. This is far, far beyond that. This is somebody who's not going to change. And if you don't get away from him, he will destroy you. He'll, this is the person that turns your own children against you and yeah. spends a 20-year period turning them against you because it suits. He wants to be more important than you. Mm. So mm. It's, a, it's just an awful, evil person. That's what we're talking about. So a lot of times that's at the center of what happens when abuse comes. And you walk through too in this section, in the biblical section, where you talk about remarriage too. And that as people are getting over the guilty feelings they have of divorce, the, the, the biblical understanding of remarriage is something that you address here. So tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, this is a very controversial topic. It's not for God. I think he's clear in the Bible, which I had to, had to study these passages very carefully. Because many in the Christian community, for their own reasons, uh, these are petty, judgmental people. They don't care. There's a there's a pretty large camp. They don't care what happened in your divorce, whether it was your fault or not. You cannot remarry. And the mm -hmm. point is some verses where Jesus talks about remarriage, and he doesn't mention any of the reasons or doesn't mention remarriage. Well, that, there are other verses they're missing. Bottom line, if you had a biblical reason for your divorce, and, and, and one of those three we mentioned earlier, adultery, abandonment or chronic emotional abuse and you divorce for that reason then by ipso facto you are you are free to remarry it's not yeah. your fault it was your spouse's fault and you now if you marry someone who's a christian first corinthians seven makes that clear but if okay you he will give you a total reset now here's the tricky part here's where people kind of fall down and have a fit over it and my christian publishers wouldn't have this book i think most of them even in the event that, okay, you I, you would say, Dave, I, Andy, I, my, it was my fault my marriage ended on me. I did one of those three uh, you know, marriage sins. I was divorced. 
whether I filed for a bogus reason or I was filed on my fault, I own it. Even those people, guess what? Jesus Christ died for that sin. He absolutely mm -hmm. did. If you'll receive that forgiveness and confess and do some recovery steps, then you are also free to remarry. People don't like to hear that. Right. They would say you have to suffer the rest of your life, never remarry, and not even date, frankly, if you don't mind, because of that sin. It's mm -hmm. like Jesus didn't die for that sin. Well, yes, he did. So if you right. heal and you put, you marry, you, you of course you do your healing and you put God at the center of your personal life and your new relationship, your new marriage, God, guess what? God's going to bless that. He'll give you a fresh right. start. Amen. And I love how that emphasizes, it. yeah, this is great. I love emphasizing and stressing the importance of repentance, even if you were the person in the wrong. And, and of course, you said heal. Like you have to move. It doesn't mean that you get to, uh, where, where you're not giving clearance for the person who um, had an affair with their secretary to go ahead and just marry their secretary in the same way and just keep things going because every you know, ever coming through and working through a, a mode of repentance. So well, right. The the dirt balls, and, and I saw plenty of those you have in your ministry too. Yeah. If I have an affair, my secretary divorced my wife, I'm not sorry. Don't think I did anything wrong because I'm a narc. God will not that you are committing ongoing adultery with that new person. Right, that right, will never right. stop. And God won't bless it. Uh no, th th this is the person who says, I before God, and this is all God requires. Praise him. I'm so, my fault. I own it. I was wrong. I'm 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 claiming your forgiveness for this, Lord. And then, and then there's a healing process, and then, and then a reset. And yeah. I have known, we have known many of our friends who who got divorced for non-biblical reasons. They admit it now, but God has brought them to new Christian partners. They've done the healing, and they're happy, and they're serving the Lord, and it's it's wonderful. God loves restoration. That's why He's God. Amen. I love it. This is that was a really helpful chapter that you had, like for these people who are thinking about the fact that they they know they look now and they say, "Man, I did this because I wasn't happy. That that was the wrong reason." How, what do you recommend? Like, let's imagine that that's in a situation where somebody wasn't a Christian, or maybe they were a nominal Christian and they they got divorced because they, well, I'm just not happy. I'm not fulfilled. We fight all the time. That whatever it is. And now they recognize that that was wrong and they're maybe moving on to a different relationship. What, what do you recommend? And I know you have a recommendation for this. They do with their former spouse. You, you're going to have to make that right as much as you can. Now I've had some cases and this is a wonderful thing. It doesn't have to happen. However, but if you, if you, if you, if you divorced your spouse, cause you were unhappy and you're not married and your ex spouse isn't married, mm -hmm. then the reaching out could include healing together, making it right. And then actually reconciling that, Amen. Yep. Hey, that happens and God would bless that. If that's not going to happen, either one of you are remarried. Still, you need to go back and clean up the mess. Um, and if the person wasn't abusive, then you're going to go back and there's some steps you have to, you, you, you're looking for not necessarily in-person meeting, but some letters and some contact where I'm sorry, I was wrong. You make, you make it right. You would ask for forgiveness, even if they don't grant that. Okay. With that before God, you've done all you can. And so yeah, that, yeah. that's a healing moment, kind of working it through. Because if you don't do that, it will keep you in shame on some level and it will affect your new marriage. Well, we mm -hmm. don't want that. And the Bible's clear. You're at the altar, Matthew 5. And, and there's something between you and someone else. You stop what you're doing at the altar and you go to the person. Okay, that's what we're saying. And that's very difficult to do. And the world would laugh their head off at that. Well, you, you had every right to get divorced. They don't care about marriage and you're unhappy. That's a great reason. Well, no, it's not. So you're saying I was wrong. And that I've heard from people that have gotten those kind of calls or the, their letters, and it means the world to them. Wow. And, and yeah. It allows them, even the person that was wrong, to release it and kind of heal. And, and especially if you have a kid, that's a way to really kind of heal. So as you're parenting, co-parenting and all that, it just helps. But yeah, I think it's important to do. You don't just pray to God and move on. You have to deal with that person, I think. And, and marriage is such an intimate, important thing for society and the way God has instituted pre-political pre institutions. It's a part of the very essence of how we exist as people. But I'm curious, Dr. Clark, do you think like that same approach, this biblical approach, psychological approach is something that could even be applied to other sin? May, uh, maybe you've uh, cheated somebody in the past and it's all over. You've repented. You've recognized your problem. But is that something that you should go back and, and do something similar? I absolutely think so. There's no caveats in scripture. Uh, and it could be a neighbor. It could be a, a previous business partner. Anyone you have wronged, 
you you need to make that right. This doesn't happen in society very often because <laughs> there's so many narcissists. And I don't think I have to do that. That would be awkward. Well, you know what? Sharing Christ is awkward. You have to do it. So yeah, you make the approach. And again, people would say, oh, but I know, I know that person and they'll be angry and they'll be furious and they'll treat me bad. You don't know that. And that isn't the mm -hmm. point anyway. You make the approach. And, mm -hmm. and you're simply admitting fault and asking for forgiveness. And, and, and that's what that's your responsibility. But in many cases, that will be well received. Because you're not calling and saying, that was your fault. You lousy right, so-and-so. Right. Well, of course not. I'm I'm owning it. I that was wrong. And in the and the Bible is clear on this too. If there's if there's if you defrauded someone and there was there's money involved, then you pay that money back. Zacchaeus mm -hmm. in the Bible, in the New Testament. Right, right. Restitution. I mean, for heaven, how much did that cost the man? <laughs> Whoa, he made it right. And God honors that. And so mm -hmm. you, that, because if you don't do that, Satan loves it if you don't do that, because then it's still a thing in your life. And it's like a cancer. It's eating you alive. It's affecting everything because you carry that. Yeah. I had an example of my life. Let me tell you this real quick. I just, I just thought of it. I had wronged a man and his wife years ago at church. I was a deacon. I was too, too young to be a deacon, frankly, but that's another story. They asked me and I said, yes, but I, 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 it wasn't some awful thing, but it was awful enough. I, I had them removed as Sunday school teachers because of some situation that came to my attention and I was wrong. Hmm. I, I got, I misinterpreted. And so it took me probably a couple of years until I heard my pastor talk about it. If you've wronged someone, I thought, okay, that's, that's these dear people. And as it happens, I was going to my car thinking, how can I, and they're standing right by my car, this very couple. Wow. <laughs> I thought, whoa. And I walked up and I said, I am so, I just have to say, I'm. it shouldn't have taken this long. I was wrong. I'm sorry for doing that to you. And they were so gracious to say, you know what? It's okay. We forgive you. But that was a big, I was carrying that. Yeah. Well, I didn't carry that. I made a mistake. Now, when you go back to do that type of thing, I'm curious. Uh, I've had occasionally had people come to ap apologize to me, but it hasn't felt very much like an apology. Like somebody said to me one time, I'm sorry that you felt that uh, I wronged you. <laughs> right. Uh, right. What's a good apology? Like, how, how do we do that? Well, that's a good question. It has to be hard. Nothing worse than a lame apology. Like you just <laughs> mentioned. Were mistakes made? Certainly. Do I feel badly? Yes, I do. No. You, you like these folks, I said, look, I am, I am very sorry. And it's heartfelt. I'm yeah. feeling pain. I'm very sorry for what I did to you. And then you tell them what you did to them. You make it clear so they know. Here's yeah. what I did. Here's what I said. Absolutely wrong. The other key is I own 100% responsibility. And I, and furthermore, the next stage is, and I, I'm trying to understand, I will never fully, but the pain I caused you. Mm. Not just lip service. Uh, I didn't yeah. probably hurt you. No, no. And then the last stage is, and these dear folks didn't do this, but I would have been okay with it. If you if you want to talk this out with me, if you need to vent now or spend some time talking about it, I I'm here. You right. you name right. the time and that's an apology. We are going to we're in the relationship, not the okay, like reading off a card. And I, I okay, got that because you know they don't get it and they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> this is so important because as we're trying to, you're trying to give people a prescription for getting over the guilty feelings they have for things that have happened in the past that are wrong, getting over the guilty feelings in divorce. And so like, that's the title, that's the, the subject of this book. And, and the second section for this shame destroying method is to really work through the psychological conditions that are needed to move beyond the shame. So we've, we've addressed some of it a little bit, but anything you want to say about what happens in that phase? Yeah, this and this this will take some time to do, but I've seen these stages work very effectively. You gather a support team. Okay, God, of course, is on the team. A recovery coach, close friends, someone that's mentoring you, maybe a Christian therapist, and th and then you start reaching out to these people. You're going to do two things. You're going to go to all those who harmed you and traumatized you in your past. This is not just mm -hmm. around the divorce. That's of course a key part of it, but. Since Satan will use any trauma and transfer it to your current trauma, the divorce, okay, you're going to go back, mom, dad, the neighbor boy down the street that abused me, uh, someone else, a, a friend that betrayed me, a previous marriage where they had an affair and devastated, okay, all that, we're going to clean all that out. And secondarily, okay, who, who have I hurt? Who have I traumatized? Who have I really wronged? Mm. Like me and that dear couple, you're going to take care of that. So what God wants in your divorce is to catch you up to the present and clean all that garbage out. Doesn't mm -hmm. have to take that. It will take three, four, five months, but you vent it verbally. 
to your therapist and your close friend and to God, a lot of venting about these things. And then depending on the circumstance, if they're an abusive person, then you, I, I'm, I'm a letter guy. So you will write what I call the throw up letter where you just you yes, dump it out. I, I can't it. believe, how could you? And that's not what, they don't send that. And then uh, for those that harmed you, and then and then the letter of forgiveness where you, okay, you this is one you can send when you just kind of condense it and here's the deal and you would send that off. I've seen that work many, many times. It's tough. It's very difficult. So it isn't just a brief prayer. God's already forgiven you. But but yes. the other person, okay, haven't hasn't had a chance, or you haven't forgiven someone. And again, the world says to you, okay, if you've been abused or sexually mistreated, and that's obviously awful, but the world wants you to hang on to that. You should never forgive that person. You should mm-hmm. hang on to that forever. Well, hey, that doesn't work. That's going to eat you alive. Now, you're not going to reconcile with that person. Okay, this is release yes. forgiveness, but you know what? Cleaning that out, that mm-hmm. gives you the fresh start God wants you to have, but it always comes with work. As Christians, we love to think that God will, and there are breakthrough moments, of course, uh, and ceremonies and prayer, but he doesn't just go, boom, you're good. I mean, you could do yeah. that, obviously, but he doesn't. He wants the process. And as, as through the process, we heal, we grow closer to him. That's what he wants. This is this, this is hard, Dr. Clark. I'm just going to admit some of these things that you're saying, it's like um, I think of some of the people, and there are multiple people who, as a result of the, you, know, you being on my podcast, have actually left abusive hard, terrible situations. And I'm thankful. It's kind of a strange thing to say. I'm thankful for it, but I'm thankful God used you in these people's lives. I'm glad that I could be a channel for that. But even thinking of some of those situations and from when I was a senior pastor, there are some real dirt bags out there, Dr. Clark. There are some real unrepentant, terrible, awful men. I'm sorry, I'm going to just keep on the men's side. I'm sure there's some, I know there are some awful women too. Um, but it's, uh, is this asking too much? I mean, is this, is this, uh, it just seems like so much to have to like, try to go back to that painful situation. I, I I don't think it is, but I want you to answer that. I imagine people are thinking it. Oh, they are. I get a lot of resistance. Do I have to? Yes, you do. Now with a dirt ball narcissist who harmed you so terribly. Okay. You're not, you're not going near that person directly. You're not. Okay. That's a fool. Okay. And, and he's going to harm you. But you will still go through the steps. In my office, I often had the, the empty chair. You're going to, okay, we're putting the dirt ball, Bob, in that chair. And you're going to talk to him. And psychologically, and God makes it happen, it's as if he was there. So you're going to write letters, all the letters, and you're going to vent. He will never know what happened because he's a dirt ball. Uh, but you still have to go. And that's very painful work, even without going near the dirt ball. He never knows what's going on. Because the, 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 the dirt ball narc will just simply use it all against you and cause more trauma. We're not doing that. But to clean it out, even behind the scenes, is hard. I have to relive that? Yes, you do. My point is, you don't know it, but you're reliving it every day if you don't do it. It never Mm. goes away. And guess what, Betty? If you don't do that with your ex and clean that out, that's going to all that stuff that's connected to him is going to be fused to your new guy, your new Mm. marriage partner. Well, Mm. you don't want that. Right. Well, that's exactly what happens. I'll never wow. trust another man as long as I live. Okay, great. If you stay single, who cares? But if you remarry, that's not right. good. Whoa. Wow. So it, it, it's, I'm always the bearer of bad news. It is brutal work, but boy, it, it works in the end. Yeah. This, I, this is what it takes. If you really want to move beyond this sense of guilt that's dominating your situation, yeah. So you walk through, you have you have th- these examples for kind of variety of cases when people were the ones who were wrong in the divorce, when they were the ones who had been wrong. And are there are there other examples too? I, I think there was a few more that you had. Or yeah, what, what were what were some of those examples of the ones that you want to help walk people through? Yeah, there's different scenarios. There is the case where okay, I I I was not at fault. My partner committed adultery or abandoned me or chronically abused me. And so and, and I file. Okay, that's 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 one yeah, yeah. And you can still feel guilty. Or it could be that, you know, okay, I, I was at fault and uh and 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 my fault and they and they filed on me. That's another scenario. A lot of people fall into the category of okay, there's no marriage, you know, ending sin that happened. None of those three, but we're just unhappy. And I divorced for that reason. That's not a biblical reason. That would be a sin. That's something you have to heal from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So th- those are the, I think the main scenarios and yeah, Satan doesn't helpful. care what the circumstances are. He's going to, he's going to still come after you. 
Well, that's good. Let's get back to that Satan piece. This is good because I love, I mean, I don't love it. I hate that we have to do this, but your section, your third section deals with the lies that come. And oh, these, these are intense. And this is so common. I, it, it's multiple chapters where you work through these lies. And then you're- Lie after lie after lie. Yes, I got, yeah. a, I got 105 of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. tell, tell us, uh, and not your favorite, tell us a few of the ones that you hear the most. Yeah, <laughs> tell us your lies, these. Dr. Clark. <laughs> I'm going to get these. Yeah, let's, let's go okay. over these. And again, these, what Satan does is, of course, Satan- He's the great liar, of course, the father of lies. So he'll find ways to breathe these into your head himself. But what he often does is he goes through other people, people that even you trust, friends, neighbors, your bastard, people that are frankly clueless, and, and they'll put this on you, Christian people. Okay. Yeah. Here's one. Here's a lie. You And these people will say this. You broke up the family with your divorce. They don't care even what the circumstances were. The response, of course, I always have a response. You're going to respond to that person. The key here is not just in your mind, but if this happened two years ago or six months ago or last week, and this person laid this on you in the church parking lot or whatever, my deal mm -hmm. is you, you're going to be assertive. And one time you're going to contact that person, email, text, whatever, phone call, and you're going to give the response. And then you're probably mm -hmm. done with them. Uh, okay. It does, of course, it's biblical. It's truth. It gives that person a chance to repent. They're probably not going to. But the answer to that is you broke up the family is the family was already broken. Now the family can heal. See, that's truth. Yes, yes, yes. I, I tell these ladies that have been in these horrible marriages, you are only, if you file, you have a right to file biblically, you're only formalizing what's already happened. He nice. has, to, the narc has destroyed it. Anyway, but the church doesn't want to face that. Here's another one. Oh, and here's, you hear this from the church all the time. The most important, you'll be told, the most important thing was saving the marriage. They don't care if you're destroyed. Saving your marriage. Okay, what you have to put up with? You made your bet. The, the truth is, what about saving me? There was no marriage to save. I mean, that that's true. Right, right, there was right. no, I haven't had a marriage for 10 years. He's treating me like garbage. But they want you to save the marriage. Okay, one of the classics, which has an element of truth to it, because we know that in Malachi 2, God hate, you'll be told God hates divorce. Right, sure, sure. Well, gosh, thanks. I'm already divorced. I guess uh, you know, the, the response to that is, and this is here's the nasty truth when you hear that. What you're really saying is God hates me. That's what they're saying without saying it. That's not true. God loves me more than the marriage. And this is what people understand. He loves you more as much as he loves marriage. He loves you more. Mm. He didn't send Christ to die for your marriage. He, he, even though it's a, a high value, he sent Christ to die for you. Amen. So these yeah. are, I think these responses, of course, I'm, I'm edgier than most people, as you know, Andy. But I think if you yeah. can approximate what I say back, it is freeing. It's empowering. And it isn't about the other person because who knows how they're going to react. And frankly, who cares? You're going to speak truth because if you take the hit and yeah. you don't say anything, it hurts you. It's another wound. And it might yeah. start kind of festering in your mind. Well, God does hate divorce. I tell ladies, he doesn't hate your divorce. You want to know why? Because he loves you. Right. And if you confess the sin, even if it was your fault, God literally says in the Bible, what? And you keep confessing it. He says, what are you talking about? It's gone. Deepest parts of the ocean, the Bible says. I'm on a rant. This is one of Dave Clark's rants. Man. Yes. Yeah, it, we'll put it on TikTok, I'm sure. Go ahead and do it. Uh, <laughs> it it's, it's so interesting to think about these lies you have. I like how you, you kind of turn around like against Satan, but it also could be that Satan is using um, somebody who is texting you. Or, or writing you and you could take i love I, I was thinking about this as i was reading this section of your book that, that you see these lies and i think you would be fine if people just took word for word what you said so for instance yeah yeah you broke your marriage vows no i didn't this is the truth i had a biblical reason to divorce so i didn't break my vows my spouse broke the laws and then here's this one my, my spouse broke my vows sorry i didn't complete that sentence then how about this when somebody says, well, you broke your marriage vows because you filed for an unbiblical reason. Here's the David Clark truth. Thanks for stating the obvious. I did break my vows, but I have repented and am completely forgiven by God. I don't ask for or need your forgiveness. I, like I just think if people are hearing these type of lies, they can just take these kind of simple pointed responses and apply them. I mean, you're okay being plagiarized in that way, right? Absolutely. I, and I, I like my words. I worked hard on those responses. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Of course, I've been doing this so long. And if, and if you say that, that's empowering and it is the truth. And, and you don't even you don't even wait for their response. It's an ongoing relationship. Now, I've had some cases where you, know, you get back to a person like that. You, you, gave, you got me. You say, look, about that thing you said to me, here's the truth. Text, email, phone call, done. And you hang up. You're done. Sometimes yeah. that person will actually be convicted and call you back or contact you and say, you know what? You're right. I had no right saying that. I'm sorry. But don't bet on it. Blind squirrels yeah. do find acorns. Not very often. These are judgmental people. And they're petty, and they believe what they're telling you. And the, and and there's there, these, there's an awfulness to this because these people, it's wolves in sheep's clothing. They want you to continue to suffer in shame for the divorce. That's that's what they want. Well, mm. that's that's not what God. That's what Satan. They're really in in Satan's uh, Satan's camp. That's not what God wants. Right. The the thief on the cross. Obviously, a, Christ had no business being on the cross. He he was guilty of no sin. But the people next to him. You know, and, and the one guy, obviously a murderer, who knows, he was he deserved to be there and Christ forgave him. What gone. So yes. murder, whatever he was, was far guilt worse than divorce, for heaven's sake. But in the church, divorce is maybe my, the number one inexcusable sin. Wow. It just Which feels is- like it dominates. Well, I love the the end of the book, the fourth section, where you work through these the the peace situations that have arisen um and so and you you get this community that's coming up with opportunities of how this really can work so tell us some of those insights as well yeah this this was great my people really came through the things that they'd actually done uh here's a few one of course and you would expect this to be the case i just i immerse myself in the bible i studied the word of god and, 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 and the verses on divorce and remarriage, that's why I made that a part of the book. And that really, it really helped because we know the power of God's word. Absolutely. Talk about nuclear power. Can't touch it. It's powerful. And then, of course, b- building a new life. If you stay static in a dark room and you never change and your life isn't different, that will always remind you of where you're stuck. So we move forward. We And that's what the local church is for. We serve. We help other people. We get out of ourselves. That was very helpful to many of my people. Um, And just the realization, one lady said, just the realization that my life was so much better after the divorce, my peace, the joy. That's what God wants me to enjoy. I don't have to feel guilty because look look what's happening now and all the way God is is blessing me. Another lady said, it may have been a guy, and I look at my children and they're better off. Even half the time not being around the narc, horrible person, has improved their lives. So just, just things like that, very practical things, family, friends. A lot of these ladies get isolated during a bad marriage, and so they, they reach back out to family and friends and church. And man, now many of them have to start with a new church, uh, but God is God is faithful. He'll lead you to the right place, and you can begin to grow and prosper. And it was just great hearing that, and they would just say, this, this is what really helped me, and now I'm at peace. That's what God wants. He wants you to be at peace. He's done with the divorce. If you confess it, done. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's interesting, Dr. Clark, is in my role as academic dean at Wesley Biblical Seminary, I often am a, the disciplinarian. Uh, sorry to say, particularly True. a student. Um, and some people, and also the person people complain to about concerns they have with their classes. And that's fine. Like I'm, that's, that's a role that I need to take on. But I had somebody come to me this past summer, and they're wanting to be a pastor. They're wanting to be a better pastor. But they said, look, my professor, I just can't, I don't, I don't, he's having me write too much. Uh, I don't want to write. And I really don't want to read either. What I really want to do is I just want to be some tips to be a better pastor. You know, can I just come to the classes and sit in the class and just have some tips and get some tips here and there? And like, I remember just listening. I'm like, man, like, and I think like some people might be listening. Maybe they clicked on this YouTube channel or however they're hearing this on the audio, like, podcast and they're saying well i i want to move past the guilty feelings but after hearing all that dr clark says and reading this book i don't want to do it it's like i'm I, it's just too hard can you get you've you've hit on it a little bit but just highlight why somebody should want this why they should pursue this work now because if you don't then you're you're stuck in guilt and you're stuck in shame and satan's not going to lose any opportunity to keep you there so you don't have to do the work, but it's not like it just goes away. Time doesn't help you. You have to do the work. So you're you're going to be stuck. And you know, God love you. You can make that choice. 
Uh, but the benefits, and, and you think about, I'm always saying the benefits, anything of value in life is worth working for. Things aren't just handed to you. You've got to work for them. Even the sanctification process. Now, salvation is completely free. Praise God. Sanctification is hard work. It just is. I have to get up in the morning and I don't have to, but I want to. But to spend time with the Lord and throughout the day and grow and serve. Faith has to be built. So the benefits of what you'll get at the end. Oh, my goodness. You know, we, we have two brothers in the same family and one uh, barely makes it through high school and ends up working at McDonald's. And that's nothing wrong with that. But he could do more. But he's he's satisfied. He, he, and that's that's where he gets yeah. no work. The other guy goes to medical school or, or even psychology school, which is harder. I'm just kidding. And, <laughs> or or he it becomes a theologian uh, like Andy yeah. Miller, dot, dot, dot. Anyway, <laughs> you will you or I, 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 you can, you know, then he really advances. OK, what's the difference work? Just mm. work. It's it's always worth it. But it's of course, it's up to you. You make the choice. Yeah, that's right. And you have to leave it to them. Um, I just want to thank you, Dr. Clark. Uh, last time we talked to you, um, you found out about my contender book and you yeah. said, look, this has got to be published. And you've got yes. to do some work, Andy. you got to you got to put it out there. And so you wrote letters for me and we got it out. And then this past summer it was published. So my thanks to you for uh, helping me realize that I needed I had something that needed to have a little wider access, you know, wider publication in the world. So you've been a great encourager to me, Dr. Clark. I'm so thankful for your time today and for this word that comes to, to people who are still trapped by their own guilt of their divorce. We want them to get beyond that. So thank you for writing this book. Well, my pleasure. And if there's an authority on Jude, I'm talking to him. <laughs> as you say in the book, nobody really talks about it. You, know, you never hear it. And it's awesome. It's in the Bible for a reason, and you've done a wonderful job with it. Yes, you have. Thanks so much. 25 verses. It's just 25 verses. But man, if we were able to read those verses and act on them and really see this call to contend, whew, anyway, it's what we need. Powerful. Yeah, it's like it's like a TikTok Bible verse. Bible there book. it is. That's Please. why you like it. Powerful. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, Dr. Clark. And people, if you're interested in this, if you're listening and you're interested in this book, there's a there'll be a link in my show notes for this, or you can go to davideclarkphd.com and you can find out more about Dave, Dr. Clark's ministry. And or maybe there's like something you're, you're aware of, like marriage challenges, dealing with uh, people who are narcissists, all these type of things. Dr. Clark has been gifted by God for this moment to be able to help you. And I I hope I hope you'll check out his resources. Thanks for coming, Dr. Clark. Yeah.